Hey folks, Nick Mock 007 here again, and today we're going to conclude our discussion on euthanasia. Uh, please leave comments letting me know uh, your thoughts on the subject. I think this topic is rife with all kinds of possibilities to continue the discussion, and that's what I enjoy most about this, uh, talking with all of you. Now, um, a few quick reminders. Uh, this is the third and final part in the series. In the first part, we briefly examined the history and ethics of euthanasia. And in part two, we looked at some topics including um, unconsciousness, perception of pain, uh, distress in the human-animal relationship. Uh, and today we're going to round out the discussion by looking at the mechanisms of euthanasia, disposal of remains, um, and specific methods to humanely euthanize both uh, fish and invertebrates. So if you came here looking for recommendations on how to euthanize a sick animal, uh, it took me three videos, but uh, you finally came to the right place. Uh, this talk may be a little bit longer than the first two, so I'm going to put in some bookmarks along the way so that you can just uh, skip to the parts that you may be more interested in. Now, remember this whole series is based on a white paper from the American Veterinary Medical Association, or AVMA, um, and I've put a link in the description below if you want to review the document in its entirety. So, there are many methods used for euthanizing animals, and uh, some, such as like gas inhalants, are just really not going to apply in the case of aquatic animals. Um, but uh, just like with those inhaled agents, um, many non-inhaled euthanasia agents can induce a state of unconsciousness uh, during which minimal vital functions are evident, but from which the animal can actually recover. So for any euthanasia method, uh, death has to be confirmed prior to um, final disposition of the animal's remains. Now, most of us are not going to be using true drugs to euthanize our animals, but just as an FYI, we do need to consider the potential for ingestion of euthanasia agents when our fish are disposed of uh, in outdoor settings. Uh, so think scavengers like birds, dogs, raccoons, or whatever else lives in your area. Uh, in fact, there are cases where veterinarians and laypersons have been fined for causing accidental deaths of endangered birds that ingested animal remains. Um, so just make sure you properly bury your fish. Um, so all of that, just a word of caution. Now, while there are multiple methods for administration um, uh, for euthanasia agents, including parenteral, which is just a fancy way of saying injection, um, oral, topical, etc., the most realistic method for fish keepers is via immersion. And this is just immersing the animal in water containing the euthanasia agent. Now, the benefit of this method is that the agent can be absorbed uh, through multiple routes. Uh, this would be things like through the gills, ingestion, and through the skin. Now, ideally, immersion agents added to the water will be non-irritating to skin, eyes, and oral and respiratory tissues, and then will result in rapid loss of consciousness. Um, remember that writing ref uh, the writing response or reflex that we already talked about, um, and with minimal signs of distress or avoidance behavior. Now, unfortunately, there's no FDA-approved drugs for euthanasia of aquatic animals, though there are agents approved by the FDA um, as tranquilizers and anesthetics for fish. Um, and these have been used off-label as euthanasia agents for aquatic animals. The main FDA-approved agent that I know of goes by MS-222, um, and if you're motivated, you can just Google it and find places to buy it. Um, but, if you can't, <clears throat> but if you can't find it, uh, just let me know, and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Okay, but before I get off on that tangent, let's actually start to move our discussion into euthanizing fish. Um, and I will also talk a little bit about euthanizing aquatic invertebrates. Remember, there's considerable evidence suggesting the likelihood that fish are able to perceive pain. So therefore, the aim is to accomplish death for these animals rapidly with a minimum amount of pain and distress. Now, I'm only going to look at euthanasia today, but if you were to look into the literature, you'd see other terms out there like slaughter and humane killing. Now, slaughter typically refers to killing an animal uh, that's intended for human consumption. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, and so maybe for those of you with like elaborate aquaponic setups, you might want to look into that. Uh, humane killing is less specific um, and is used to describe some recreational fishing practices, but can also be used to um, describe things like depopulation, eradication, um, and control to eliminate invasive fish species. But these are all outside the scope of my talk today. So first, let's think about preparation and the environment. If possible, we should withhold food, um, assuming the animal's still eating, for 12 to 24 hours prior to euthanasia. Um, this is going to reduce the chance of regurgitation, defecation, and nitrogenous waste production. The environment itself should be as quiet and non-stimulatory as possible, and light intensity should be reduced. But you still need adequate enough light so that you can see what you're doing. 
Now you don't have to get complicated here. This can be just as simple as using an opaque container with a lid or by just using less intense lighting. And uh, for all my Planet Tank folks out there, uh, red lighting is a good choice here um, since it doesn't penetrate water well. When possible, you should use the same water from the tank where the fish has been living. But if that's not possible, then just think about um, matching those water parameters as closely as possible. In essence, you have two options. Either the immersion euthanasia solution is prepared with water from the original tank and the fish is then transferred into it, or you can prepare a concentrated form of the anesthetic agent and then introduce it directly into the container where the fish is. Now, because there are thousands of species of fish and aquatic invertebrates, and they can all vary greatly in anatomic and physiologic characteristics, um, there's actually no single reliable indicator of death. However, there are some standard approaches that can be useful. Uh, these include the loss of movement, uh, loss of reactivity to any stimulus, and initial flaccidity uh, prior to rigor mortis. Now, more useful indicators for many fish include respiratory arrest, which is that uh, we can see in terms of the cessation of the rhythmic opercular activity. Uh, and we want to observe this for 10 minutes. Uh, also, the loss of eye roll, uh, which is actually a reflex um, that it's the movement of the eye when the fish is rocked si uh, from side to side. It's also important to know that the heart can continue to contract even after brain death. So the presence of a heartbeat is actually not a reliable indicator of life, but the sustained absence of a heartbeat is actually a very strong indicator of death. When considering disposition of the euthanized animal, the main goal is to reduce the risk of disease spread, prevent uh, pest and other non-target species from gaining access to the animal remains, and ensure human and environmental safety. Now my personal recommendation for most common methods we're gonna use is uh, to find a spot in your garden and bury the fish deep enough that local wildlife isn't gonna dig it up. Even with dead fish, I really don't recommend flushing into sewer or septic systems. But I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in a minute. So let's take a look at the best methods for euthanasia, and I'm going to highlight the ones that I think are most accessible to the average fish keeper. In general, there are one-step and two-step methods, and in the two-step methods, the first agent is an anesthetic agent, and then the second step is the actual euthanasia. We're mostly going to focus on one-step methods, but I will mention both techniques. Uh, the techniques are broken down into immersion, uh, injectables, and physical methods. And I'm just going to skip injectables because I don't think that's really useful for us. But if you do have questions about that, you know, let me know. Uh, One-step immersion or intentional overdose via immersion in an anesthetic solution is probably the most common method for, uh, of euthanasia for fish hobbyists. Uh, fish should be left in the anesthetic solution for a minimum of 10 minutes after cessation of opercular movement, which is breathing. Options include uh, benzocaine or benzocaid hydro, uh, hydrochloride, and this can actually be ordered online. It's a little bit pricey, so it's not one of my preferred methods. Um, there's also immersion in CO2 saturated water, but honestly, this is too difficult for the average hobbyist. Um, so I would just skip that one completely. Uh, ethanol or alcohol has a depressive effect on the CNS or central nervous system, and it concentrations from 10 to 30 milliliters of 95% uh, ethanol per liter. Um, this induces anesthesia and then with prolonged immersion produces death via uh, respiratory depression, which causes anoxia. Now, one very popular method among hobbyists is clove oil. Cloves contain a number of essential oils, including eugenol, isoeugenol, methaeugenol. Uh, eugenol itself comprises of 85 to 95 percent of the essential oils in cloves and has been used as food flavoring and as a local anesthetic for human dentistry. Now, clove oil is, uh, uh, and its extracts are very popular for euthanizing freshwater and marine fish because it's widely available, it's inexpensive, it starts to work quickly, uh, e even when you compare it with agents such as the uh, MS-222. Now, the concentrations required for anesthesia and euthanasia are going to vary depending on your species and other things, so I'm actually not going to get into exact amounts because it really is going to depend on your fish. So I would recommend you do a little bit of reading on this and specific for your fish species uh, prior to actually attempting this. Now, the main disadvantage uh, of clove oil is that it's not FDA approved for use as, an, uh, as a, a euthanasia agent. Uh, and animals euthanized with clove oil uh, are not approved for human consumption, though that's not going to affect us. Uh, some clove oil derivatives are uh, actually potential carcinogens. And the impact of clove oil residues and euthanized fish on the environment uh, or scavenger species uh, has not been determined. But despite all that, uh, the AVMA uh, describes clove oil and its derivatives as an acceptable agent of euthanasia for fish um, not intended for consumption. And in my personal opinion, this is, this is the best method. This is my preferred method. 
Um, I believe it's the least stressful method for the fish and the fish owner. Now, there are other agents that can be used in immersion, and I'm going to list those, but for the reasons I've already mentioned, I would actually just recommend using clove oil. I'm also going to list the injectable agents here uh, just for thoroughness, but again, these really aren't good options for most of us. Okay, the last main area that's worth examining is physical methods. Now, these are not for the faint of heart, and most of these are not what I would recommend. But these include things like decapitation followed by pithing. Uh, note that decapitation is a two-step method. Now, I've read several forum posts that recommend decapitation alone, but without the pithing step, it's actually not sufficient to meet humane criteria uh, for euthanasia, which we've already described. And the problem with pithing, which uh, basically just destroys the brain stem and spinal cord, is that honestly, most of us don't have any kind of training that's going to allow us to uh, adequately identify these anatomical structures. Another method is manually applying a blunt force trauma, which is, you know, cranial concussion followed by pithing. Um, so, you know, again, just clubbing a fish or hitting its head on something is not sufficient and does require that second pithing step. So again, I really don't recommend that. Another commonly used method, uh, by hobbyists at least, is rapid chilling, which is hypothermic shock, which can be a one-step or a two-step method. But there are some caveats to that method. Until further research is conducted, rapid chilling is only acceptable for small tropical and subtropical species. The small size is important because the rate of heat loss via thermal conduction uh, from a body is proportional to the, uh, the surface area of that fish's body. Now, based on these two factors, it's been suggested that rapid chilling is a suitable killing method for small tropical and subtropical fish species, 3.8 centimeters or 1.5 inches length or smaller. This measurement would be from the tip of the snout to the posterior end of the last vertebra. In order to ensure optimal hypothermal shock and therefore rapid killing, you have to transfer the fish into the ice water as quickly as possible. This means you have to make a rapid transition from the fish's normal water temperature to 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, which is 35 to 39 roughly uh, Fahrenheit. Um, you would do this by using a net to place the fish in an already chilled water bath. In addition, the fish should not be in direct contact with the ice in the water. Um, the entire surface of the fish must be placed into the chilled water. The full contact with the cold water ensures optimal exposure and rapid chilling of the fish. Now that water temperature cannot exceed two to four uh, degrees Celsius, 35 to 39 Fahrenheit. Um, so I would recommend using an insulated container like a cooler and a probe thermometer so you can maintain and confirm the water temperature. A major warning, this uh, method of euthanasia is not appropriate for temperate, cool or cold water tolerance uh, uh, fish species like uh, carp, koi, goldfish, and, and any other fish that can survive at or lower than that four degrees Celsius mark. And remember, because surface to volume considerations, you cannot use this method for medium to large bodied fish. Now, a brief word on unacceptable methods. There are many out there that should not be used under any circumstance, and the most obvious one is flushing. Uh, it's just a cruel uh, thing to do. The water chemistry and quality can actually um, cause a very slow death for the fish in the sewer systems. And if the system is um, connected to or close to natural waterways, uh, flushing a dead or diseased fish can actually spread uh, diseases to other animals. Next, it's never okay to use a slow chilling or slow freezing method for an unanesthetized fish. Um, this is, would be like putting a fish in a freezer without prior anesthesia. It's also never okay to kill a fish by anoxia and desiccation after removing it from the water uh, or leaving a fish in a container without aeration. Uh, or exposing the fish to any kind of caustic chemical. And this should be common sense, but it's also never okay to kill a fish um, by prolonged traumatic injury prior to unconsciousness. All right, we're almost done, but I also promise to uh, provide some information on euthanizing aquatic invertebrates as well. In general, overdose of uh, general anesthetic via immersion uh, is as appropriate a euthanasia strategy for aquatic invertebrates as it is for fish. Uh, because confirming the death of many invertebrates is actually even more difficult, two-step euthanasia procedures are recommended here um, in which chemical induction of anesthesia, uh, non-responsiveness, or presumptive death is then followed by an adjunctive method that destroys the brain. Uh, this could include pithing, but uh, I usually recommend things like freezing, boiling, or chemically like alcohol. But warning, skipping that first step and just using the second step like boiling or freezing is not going to meet criteria for euthanasia. So, when looking at these two-step methods, we'll start with the first step. So options would include magnesium salts, and magnesium salts are near universal anesthetic agents, relaxing agents, and, and euthanasia agents for aquatic invertebrates, but they are ineffective for crustaceans. 
Clove oil, uh, or eugenol, as we talked about before. Uh, clove oil has been used effectively as an immersion agent for the euthanasia of crustaceans at um, concentrations of uh, 0.125 milliliters per liter. Um, ethanol has also been used for euthanasia of some species such as mollusks and cephalopods. Now for the second step, my recommendation is uh, to use a physical method. Again, I don't like pything, um, but I would recommend freezing or boiling as that second step of the euthanasia procedure. Remember, just like for fish, methods of killing that do not cause rapid death or that cause trauma prior to the loss of consciousness are not considered humane methods of death or euthanasia. Um, these are the same kinds of things. They include removing an aquatic invertebrate from the water and allowing it to die by hypoxia, secondary to uh, the desiccation of tissue, um, leaving an aquatic invertebrate in a container of water without adequate aeration, um, which causes death by anoxia, or any uh, death due to exposure to caustic chemicals or traumatic injury without first inducing unconsciousness. All right, folks, honestly, I am glad to be done with this series. Uh, reading a hundred plus page paper on, you know, that had diagrams and, you know, all this kind of stuff on killing just about any animal you can imagine was not my idea of enjoyable. Um, but I also now feel much more informed on this topic. Um, I truly hope I never have to use this information in the future, and, and I wish the same for you. Um, but if you do, first, my sympathies. Um, second, I hope this has been helpful. All right, I'm going to sign off here, and I'll be back to talk at you next week. But seriously, I'm, I'm picking something fun. I'm, I'm tired. See you next week.